Welcome back to the French Rugby Podcast with me, Tim Groves, and Johnny's away on holiday. We all need one of them every now and then, don't we? Who who is able to have a podcast and just leave it for a week? I mean, I can't believe the lack of professionalism of this dude. Take your microphone wherever you go, <laughs> can't you? Yeah. <laughs> Says the guy who hasn't been here for four weeks or something. But yeah, <laughs> you're back though. You're back refreshed. Have you been away? So I have been away actually. Uh, two or three weeks ago, went went on a beautiful holiday with with the family and stuff. Haven't done that for feels like forever. Just a lot of work. I had, I graduated, right? I told you that last time. I've got my my diploma. Everything's done and dusted. Um, new job is in sort of venture venture capital investment. Um, taking me a lot of time. Still using comms and pods just to digest and chat about rugby, which I adore. Which I am lucky enough to call a little bit of extra work, but it, it really doesn't feel like it. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I just bagged everything. Is that right? Where do you want to go? What do you want to do? Let's just pick a place and go. And went to the beach with the girls. It was absolutely sensational. It actually rained for the first two days. Who cares? We still went swimming. The girls had a blast. It was just one of those moments when, you know, press pause and we realized, bloody hell, life is beautiful. Uh, we were super happy. And um, and I came back refreshed, yeah. And you went straight from the business and the beach to Claremont. I know you were at Welford where this weekend, but the week before you were back in Claremont and you were saying you'd barely been back since you retired, since you left. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those. I, I don't have a contract uh, to to do commentaries in, in England. It's just I get called up by the producers. You know, do you fancy this game, that game? So I, I know there, obviously there's, we negotiate the fee and all that, but they don't guarantee you anything. And usually they call you up a couple of weeks before. Do you fancy that one, that one? I look at the traveling, I look at the game. Yeah, you know, yes, no, yes, no. This one, as soon as I saw Claremont Tigers, I mean, he, my phone could not, it was burning in my pocket. Got it out, texted the BT guy. I was like, mate, you've got to put me on those two games. It's too good to be true. Um, you know, sort of the case of Derby. I was, I was, I was absolutely delighted, but not so much for the actual, well, the game, the, the, both games themselves were okay. Uh, the fact that Claremont are just not doing so great at the moment made it a little bit um uh, not as good as it should have been, but just the, the chance to work and have to go back to Clermont and work and have to go back to Leicester was just too good to be through. So, no, so I did both games and I absolutely adored it. A proper trip down memory lane. I mean, we can speak about it for days, but so all people, I, I went back into a stadium where I didn't want to be Johnny Big Nuts, you know, rocking up. No, I don't need a ticket to get in there. Come on, you know, it's obvious. Red right. carpet was out, was it? No, well, Cl- Clermont, listen, I've, I've 10 years, huh? 10 years in Clermont, so, so I, I was a bit more confident going back to Clermont. I still know everyone. And it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And actually, for the little story, I saw my, the, the VC team. I took them to Clermont. And so I worked on a Sunday, and then we stayed for two days together to do a bit of team building. We went walking the mountains on Monday and stuff. I mean, Clermont was surrounded by some beautiful, beautiful little mountains. There's 80 old uh, volcano crater. I don't know how you call that. Uh, crater. You know, yeah. Like collapse crater. Collapsed the volcanoes. There's eight, a chain of eighty of them that are in like the world uh, UNESCO uh, World Heritage. Uh, they're classified now, and it's absolutely stunning. The weather was beautiful, um, and and so basically did the game. Amazing stadium, more miles. I mean, if you ever have the opportunity to go to France to watch a game, go to Clermont. It's worth the trip. It's Thomond Park. It's Welford Road. It's it's one of those stadiums. You close your eyes, you know you're you're there and nowhere else. And I saw Ellis Genge and, and Brett Deeks and Benny Youngs while he was sick. But all these guys, they cut up and they're like, wow, we love this place. It's just special. You know, it, it's one of those you walk in, you're like, it's a treat to play and, or to come and watch a game in, in, in such an environment. And the fans are, are up for it. And it was amazing. So no, I was, I was so happy. I was giggling like a, like a little teenager texting mates before and X, Y, and Z. And actually, I properly got caught up with emotion, like proper uh, I got there the, on the day and in Clermont, people don't really know it because you can't really see it. But obviously you have the two sort of corridors that face each other with the, both change rooms and they come into a little tunnel that comes out. And on either side, you can't see it, but they they made those big yellow metallic walls uh, in which every single player that's played for the game does a little signature and you put the date of your arrival and the date of the departure. And they asked everybody to sign it. There's a big symbolic moment where you go and add your date of departure, you know? And, and I realized that I never written mine and my date of departure. And they just, I don't know, never thought about it. Never, I got asked to do it, whatever. And I was walking there and I swear to you, I, I could recognize my footsteps 
and I, I was obviously wearing shoes. I wasn't wearing studs like I used to, but I could, I could almost picture myself walking in shorts. If I mean, if I closed my eyes, I could have felt my studs walking into those steps, having a look at that signature where before every game, I was like, before I put that number, when I leave, I just, just want to know that I've emptied my tank just one more time, you know, then I got out, I saw this beautiful sparkling change um, stadium with the fans starting to go in. And I was like, wow, this is special. And that really brought me back to, the, to, the, to, those, to those moments. And then you see Dato Ziracashvili, the tight head prop, who is now a scrummaging coach for, for Clermont. And he walks out and, you know, we catch each other's corner. Of, I, I mean, he's a tight head prop I played the most in my whole career. Because Clermont was the club that I played for the most in my whole career. And he was there the whole time. And then Morgan Parra, who just rocks up that little shit, who's a really good boy. And he's really one of my best mates. And he rocks up and, you know, we exchange a look. And I, he's the number nine that I played the most in my whole career. Um, you know, so there's just, just, just too many people that I care about, a place that I care about so much. And then to just to top it off, there's Leicester on the other side that's bringing me to another, you know, sort of emotional trip. So no, it was, it was an extraordinary game. I adored it. And the game itself was, was completely well-deservedly won by Leicester. They completely dominated. Very, very smart, very powerful, very well drilled and organized. Um, and then I smashed some beers with some friends. And then on Sunday, on the Monday, we went up walking in the mountains. Stunning moment of, of, of hiking in the mountains. It was amazing. And then at night, we had more time. And I got some of those old fellas, the Datos, the Morgan, the Paul Gidraziak, the Arthur Ituria, Fritz Lee, all the boys that I really enjoy. And they came up to meet my new team, which was quite a cool moment, you know, the VC team meeting the other team. And we all had a good dinner because I, I really love those moments where you can just sit down and take the time to, uh, you never have the time to do anything. This time we took the time to sit down three, four hours dinner. And it was just a lovely, lovely moment. So precious, very precious. And on top of that, I was paid. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> it's like a triple win. And you mentioned maybe not quite as emotional at Leicester. You obviously loved your time there, but far less long than you spent at Claremont. But you mentioned Brett Deacon is there. You know him well. You know other guys there well. So we haven't really spoken much about your time at, at Tigers on here. So it must have been a bit of a culture shock when you went there to Leicester and still some guys there that you know well. I think, I think there's, al there's always a story be 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 behind a move that sort of, you always put it, need to put it into context, right? The reason why, I don't, I don't, I'll speak about Leicester in a second, but the reason why I fell in love so much about Clermont is that, I don't know if I ever told you this, but I traveled a lot when I was young, like a lot, lot. My dad was a strategy consultant. We traveled the world, went to the States, went to China, whatever. And I think in, from the age of 11 to the age of 18 or 17, whatever. So those six, seven years, I think in seven years, I did eight schools because wow. we traveled so much. And one year I even did two, which was extraordinary. That's where I learned my English. That's the reason why we're speaking to each other now. Uh, when, um, that's why I always enjoy others. I enjoy learning about others. I've always enjoyed, um, I've always been um, culturally um, curious. I always, you know, I want to travel. I want to learn about others. I'm going to speak to others and I speak Spanish. And, you know, I, I, I love others. I want to learn from others and I love that stuff. That's why even when I was in Stad, I was the one hanging out with all the RGs. When I was in Leicester, I was hanging out with all the RGs too, with Castro and stuff. But then when I was in Clermont, I was always the link between the foreigners and the French. That's why I love European rugby so much because the refs would come to speak to me and it was my time. You know, I, international is, is my time. I'm not a citizen of the world. Like I love France, don't get me wrong. And I'm proud to be French, but it was really important to me. And, um, but that, but all that is a gift, but it came with a bit of a downside, which was when I was 14, 15, you would ask me, where are you from? And I would hide in a, in, in a, I wanted to dug a hole to hide before I answered that question. Cause I didn't have a bloody clue. I was born in Paris. I would answer Paris, but in total, my, I, I lived four or five years of my life in Paris. So if they ever asked me for a street, for a restaurant, for recommendation, I had no clue. And, and that, was, that, that was like a problem for me. Not problem, but you know, it, was, it bugged me a bit. And, and in rugby, I don't know how it is in England, but in France, it's super, super regional when you're young. You know, because you start from the age of six, seven, eight in your club. Yeah. So where you're from is so important, right? You do things a different way. If you're from Beret, you don't do the same thing as in Toulouse, as in Stade, as in uh, Toulon and Nice and all that. It's just Perpignan, the Catalans, you know, it's completely different. So who you are really defines you. And I didn't have a bloody clue. And on top of that, I was the only one from Paris who was getting picked in the under 17s, under 18s, uh, school, sort of schoolboy rugby, you know, for, for the French team. So it, it was it, it was a bit of a 
culture shock for me. And I never really understood, you know, there was a bit of sense of belonging that was missing. I adored Stad, I loved Leicester. But then when I got to Clermont, I really connected with the place. I connected with the people. I connected with the simple, humble, hardworking, genuine, good people. Uh, my, my, my girls are born there. Uh, I was living with my wife there. That's, that's where we got married uh, when we were in Clermont. You know, I, re I really built myself as a, as a man. I did my best rugby years there. And, and all that is down to also, I was in Leicester. I got contacted by uh, Clermont to sign there. When you could say I was sort of at the peak of, of my hotness. I was starting hooker for Leicester. We were killing it. I was picking for the French team. You know, the big offer comes, boom, boom, boom. You have loads of clubs coming at you. The, I go back to Stad because I take the most stupid decision ever, but, you know, it's out of, uh, not arrogance, but out of pride because I didn't want Dimitri to tell me that I couldn't go back uh, and I wanted to see more of my granddad and all that. And then I'm there and, my, and I have a shit season, especially shit, shit, six months. Clermont comes back with the same offer, same length of contract, same money. And it just can't work because I need to, whatever. I, it can't work. I've got two years instead. And then in the end, I found to, I sign in Castres, knowing that two months later, I can start looking for somebody else. And Clermont come back with the same offer, the same length, the same thing. And I remember speaking to Vern. And I'm like, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you stuck with me in, at the time where the press, I, it was even in the French press, there was like the, the, the highs and lows of recruitment one year. And I was in the lows. The year before, I was the hottest thing they've ever seen. I was like the flop of recruitment of Stade Francais because I wasn't performing as I should be. And he's like, mate, if I believe you then, I believe you now. I'm not in here for the for six months. I want to sign you four years and you'll be my number one hooker. I was like, Poof. You know, it was, it was exactly the type of confidence that I needed. So what I'm trying to say is the reason why I connected so much with that place is because I got given a lot of confidence. I wanted to give it back. I got given a lot of love by the people. I wanted to give it back. I built myself as a bloke there and I, I, I will always cherish it for a long, long time. But, but Leicester is, is the same idea. There's always a story behind. I'm, I'm in Stad and I don't want to re-sign. I'm, I'm going to re-sign in Stad. I didn't want to go anywhere else in France. But because I learned how I already how to speak English, I was sort of thinking about it. And then I'm sitting next to, I told you that story. No, I was sitting next to Augustine Pichot. Yeah. And he's like, you know, where are you going to go? Oh, why not Leicester? Done. And it was, it was an incredible move for me. I obviously met my wife there, good people. And I remember, so when we was in Clermont, I bumped into Brett Deeks who with the Deacon brothers and Johnny Murphy and Jordy Murphy, Luke Abraham and Castro and Marcos and all those guys were really my, uh, um, Richard Blaze, all, the, all those boys that I really, really got along well with and were a real tight unit of blokes hanging out all together nonstop. And we were speaking with Deeks and stuff before the game. And I was like, oh, you know, it was good. I was like, oh, I'm so happy to see Tigers back. So yeah, yeah, And we look at each other. He's like, mate, boy, did we have a good time. <laughs> and, I, and 2007, we had an amazing time. Like at, at that time, we thought rugby, that's how it was. Kill people on a Saturday, go and smash on a Sunday, have fun, have mates everywhere. We didn't realize how lucky we were. Those two seasons I had in Leicester were extraordinary. And bringing it back to the present, obviously... Brett's still there. Yeah. Borthwick's come in. They're doing a pretty good job of doing it a new way, but also going back to the old school, aren't they? Bringing some of that old school Leicester grit in and it's showing. Um, amazing, amazing uh, transformation, which is, um, which is what hurt me when I was in Clermont. They were like, oh, all the managers were like, oh, two, three years are going to be complicated. The next two years, they were like, look at Leicester. They turn it around in 18 months. So Steve Borthwick is no... Is no fool. He's a really good coach, obviously. But I think they, Leicester, it, the, the Leicester way was a lot bigger, a lot harder, and a lot more central than anybody gave it ever credit to. It was always a joke. Oh, Leicester, you know, they're a bit rough and tough and crazy Tuesday and all those things. That's all I was hearing. With crazy Tuesday because it was full on brawl, contact session, scrummaging, bowling, and, and all that. Yeah, okay. But that was the Leicester way. Hmm. And, and it was, um, and as soon as you started de deviating a little bit away from it, now we're not going to go as hard you know just we're okay now because we're winning then it, it, it's it's sort of a poisonous little thing that you that you you curse yourself with and then they put a lot of money on a couple of few players that didn't that either were international duty or just weren't or weren't fit and they let go the core of that team the the guys who were always there the guy who actually hold the guys who hold the change room you know so there was and you don't realize how how quick it can go bad 
and how deeply wounded the whole organization can be by just a few little decisions like that. And I think that's what Leicester, uh, Clamore are experiencing now. And if there's one thing that I really want is for them to use Leicester as a good example, set back the Leicester way, the Clermont way, right at the center of things, take a few decisions and decide one season is going to be a transformation, but the rest you put back the ambition and the, and the target all the way at the top. And that's what they did really well. So no, no, they're, they're properly back. They've gone to the new era of rugby whilst keeping the Leicester way alive. And Welford Road is still a smashing place. And um, no, they're an incredible club. And there are parallels between the cl- two clubs as well. Leicester in the Midlands in yeah. England, the rough, tough, Claremont and the massive Central. W- what does Jono say about it in terms of, does he see it as a two or three year job or does he think he can do it quicker? <laughs> so I don't know if I should say this, but I spoke to him before. I couldn't actually speak to him after the, the I went in their changing rooms after the game, the Claremont leicester game. They were obviously very disappointed. 19 points lost at home. You know, you sort of think, oof, next week you go to the top of the Prem. It's, it's almost missing impossible with some injuries. So he was really, really peed off, let to say the least. Um, but I got to speak to the boys and they're like, yeah, it's, it's, it's all about leadership. They, they need not three leaders. They need 10 to transform the team. Morgan's going to leave at the end of the season. Camille's going to leave at the end of the season. They can't just always hang on to the same guys. Um, that was our strength when we were there. There wasn't. It was not obviously just about me, but it was like ten of us. And and it's when Rougerie leaves that you realize, bloody hell, he was one hell of a leader, <laughs> and he's not he's not a player anymore. It's when Julien Bonner leaves and Alex Lapendry is injured and Damien Chouli leaves and Jamie Cudmore in his own way and Nathan Hines in his own way. You know all those guys. Dato Dato was massive, a huge leader in the change room, and and you had twelve of them. You know that's they always say the, the core leadership. You had twelve now. They have three, four who are struggling to impose it on others. And every time things are going wrong, it's like, where's Morgan? Oh yeah, come on, come and save us. You know, come and come and dug us out. It just doesn't work like that. So they're going to be forced to move on to a new thing with, with Morgan going to stat, which is, I think, a great decision for him and for Clam. They need to move on. And, and they're going to force out. So I couldn't really speak to Jono after that. And I actually bumped into him at Leicester before the game. And he, we were looking at the stadium and it was more... We want to do well. He was really excited about that young nine, who I don't know if you saw the game, that Juno, he's only 18. Wow, was he good. Mm. Really good player. Actually, I, and I spoke to Rougerie afterwards. It's one of those scouting stories that he came to watch an academy game of another player. And that Juno was, was in, um, in the opposition team. And they were turning around, who the hell is this nine? Stocky little thing, only 17 or whatever, who was really killing it out there. And the sign. So there are sparks of hope. Him, uh, Cher Tibergian, the fullback wing who did really well, Raka is still young. Damien Pono is going to come back. They're going to have two young uh, tens, you know, between Jules Plisson and uh, Anthony Bello from, from Toulon who's coming. There's still some really good players, and I'm sure they, but they need to create their own story. But Jono's description of the situation, and he only left the club in 2017, I think, uh, on the title. He lost it, yeah. He left, he left for Ulster after we won it. So it's only five years, right? It's nothing. It's yesterday. And he's like, mate, they, the, lead, the, the, the decision makers fell, fell asleep at the wheel. That was, that was his quote. So there's a lot of, like I said, little problems, contract decision making, recruitment decision making, general hierarchy and leadership within the team. If you don't push higher, then you, you just shoot, you shoot down. You know, it's not, a, it's not an easy road of saying we can cruise. There's no cruising in ultra competition. We'll come into some of the other games in a minute, but we don't see these two-legged games very often. So I don't know if you were a fan before these round of 16 games, but have you changed your mind at all? Are you a fan now? Yeah, I really liked it, I must say. I, I liked it in the sense that it was it was exciting. Uh, whatever happened in the game, even if you're going to win by one point, but win by one point wasn't much because you didn't know what was going to happen. So, you know, it made things super interesting. Yes, I adored the different type of strategy. So typically, Clermont Leicester, in Clermont Leicester, they really outpunched them by, by being relaxed, chilled, seizing the opportunities, using kicking game. And on, on the way, on the return leg, it was quite clever because Le- Leicester actually were completely dominating in ball possession, but they were happy of defending. They're like, mate, they're going to play. Their only issue is to play 19 points down. They have to overly play. If we try to match the play and make a mess out of this game, we actually can, you know, fall on the faces. So they were super smart, ready to, to suffer. Leicester were ready to suffer. 
to win that game and paid a tremendous amount of respect to Clermont and be like, all right, you're going to play. We're not going to overly commit in the ruck. And there were some long defensive sequences. I think they tackled, I think it was at the end of the stat, 180 times and Clermont tackled 70 times. So, and, and they won again. And when it's the return game, when you win at home after winning by 90 points difference, the first one, it, it almost shocks you in terms of statistics. I thought they were very respectful and very clever. It was actually a very tough game. It's, it's, it's a bit random. So that made it super interesting in my geeky rugby knoll sort of mind. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed it the same way that Ulster were like all super happy punching up in the air after winning in Toulouse by six points. And then, you know, the magic little man after a clumsy first 50 minutes just turned it around the last 30 minutes um, in Ravenhill. So, no, I, I thought I thought it was super interesting. Um, the only shame that I thought it was to see um, multiple, uh, uh, how you said, multiple same country confrontations. Yeah. That does make it a little bit. I mean, I thought the whole idea was to prevent them, but you had you know Stad against Racing and Bordeaux against um, La Rochelle and all those things. So, and it's not going to get any better because they play again. I, mean, I was looking at La Rochelle. Imagine if they beat Bordeaux. Then they get, what is it, Montpellier at home. They, they can do it. But if they win, they could get racing. And then they could get to lose in the final. Yeah. So they could go, they could do you know, a whole Champions Cup without ever facing what makes the beauty out of this competition, which is the clash of cultures and people and teams and nationalities and all that. If the French teams dominate as much as they are, you can't keep them <laughs> apart forever. Yeah, true. True that. And in terms of that French success, there have been so many teams in the knockout stages. What do you put it down to? Obviously, we know that rugby in France is flying at the moment internationally. Last year, three of the semi-finalists were French. Could be the same this year. Is it down to the clubs being better organised than they ever have done before? Better coached? Is it the financial power? Combination of all of the above? Uh, is it fair to say that the, the last two years that you're talking about when Saracens got relegated? That's number yep. one. I just think that, and to my delight, that the French teams are finally falling in love with that competition as much as Racing, Clermont, Toulouse, that everybody's keying up for it. The main difference is La Rochelle, probably influenced by John O'Gibbs and Ronaldo Garana. now. Um, and, and I think the French fans are falling in love with the competition too. They, 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 want, they want to see it. So there's obviously a, an economical battle. So it's down to... It's down to maybe a bit more tightness in terms of how many English clubs can genuinely go for it. It used to be sort of six, now it might be only three, you know, if, if that's fair, given that the Saracens are not in it. Whereas France has gone the other way. It used to be three, and now to be fair, it's more like six or seven teams that can actually seriously go for it. Well, seven or eight qualifies, but eight qualify. So, um, you know, six at least can really go for the title. Um, and that they're they're really up for it. So no, so that change of mentality for me is is ideal, is perfect, is where it should be. And the other general theme of the weekend, more negatively, was cards. Twenty cards in the eight Champions Cup games in all, which equals the most ever in a round of that competition. We're seeing a sending off every other game at the moment in Super Rugby. You did the Paris Derby as well, which yeah. saw Stefan Ivalu sent off, Oli Chesham obviously in the Leicester Clermont yeah. game. The 20 minute red cards being trialed in Super Rugby, World Rugby said last week they might want to expand that. What do you make of it all? Is it the player behavior that's the problem? Is it the officiating? Is it both? So I, I don't buy the, um, oh, look, uh, against, against Ireland, uh, it, ki- it killed the game because, um, what's his name? Charlie Hewells, I think it was. Yeah. I got a red card. You know, mate, he, he bollocked a guy who didn't have the ball. Yeah. It's the risk. It's rugby. I don't think that should be sanctioned by six months away. But a, but a red card is a red card. Done. All right. Um, Oli Chisholm, did you look at his reaction? He turns around. He says, sorry, to, sorry. I think it was Raka or... I can't remember if it was Raka or... or no, it was Sam uh, Samizela. Yeah. And he turns around. He says, sorry. He goes, he gives him a hug and he goes. Mate, that's, that's all the answer that you need. That means that rugby players know I, I cocked up. I just missed him. It's a little bit too high. I could have hurt him. Red card. Um, the Naivalu try really annoyed me. Like we were going, oh yeah, but the technique and this one. But look at the state of Louis Dupichot. Mate, he's on the floor, head, um, how you say that, scraping the floor over four meters, completely knocked the life out of him because 
because of that poor technique, we're talking about the shoulder, yes, but they didn't see that he actually connected head on head just after. You know, he goes shoulder and then head on head. Does he on purpose try to hurt him? No, of course not. I'm not, I'm not blaming Naivalu. I'm just saying poor technique has to be sanctioned. Uh, Charlie Wool's poor technique has to be sanctioned. Is it part of rugby? Absolutely. He's jacked up and he's pumped up and he wants to fly. And I've made stupid mistakes because I got overexcited and that, that should have been pinged, yes. The only gray zone, which is the tough one, is the contact in the air. Because at the moment, sometimes pff, they do, just don't take the same decisions. I don't know if you saw the um, Ulster Toulouse uh, one. At one yeah. point, Otoma Ramos falls on his head, does like a 180 degree spin in the head, falls on it. No, he committed to it. What on earth is he on about? He didn't even try. He barely tried to jump. He was a week too late on, on that contest. I mean, that, that, that's how clear, as, as clear as it should have gone. But for me, the only gray zone is Xander Ferguson that clear out uh, Scotland Wales. Yeah. That's the really tough one. What do you do with them? That, that's the only really, really tough call on that. When it's, an, it's a clear accident. I don't really know what he can change. That's my, that's my only question. If the answer is the player can't change anything to it. If it's a contact in the air, well, you got to read better. You only got to go, you know, you got to slow down your feet, go. If it's a Charlie Ewells, well, you just can't whack up a guy who doesn't have the ball. If you're not sure if you're going to commit, go slowly, push him off, go again. To the point of potentially missing the tackle. Don't get me wrong. That's, that's the outcome. Uh, Oli Chesum, then mate, if, if, if um, that means you can't, dominate the tackle when you're chasing him from the from behind naivalu you can't prevent the try you simply can't if the guy is a meter away and you try to whack him you've got to go for the legs there's almost zero chance for you to prevent him to score it that's that's the reality but he can make it done the decision xander Ferguson, what else are you going to tell him he's tight at prop he's here to clean rocks he's flying into this the guy lifts exactly at the wrong moment and he not and he clocks him in the head the reality is that he can seriously hurt him so that's where potentially, potentially, the the orange card could be a good or not the orange card, but the twenty minute red card could be a good idea. For me, there's always there's already a twenty minute thing, which is does the guy get suspended six weeks, or does the guy not get suspended at all? So maybe it's the sanctions rather than the the sanctions off the field rather than the sanctions on the field that they need to look at. But in terms of in my mind, yeah, what they said last week, looking at Super Rugby, is. It doesn't matter whether it's the shoulders to the head or getting taken out in the air. If you get a red card, 20 minutes, and then they bring someone else on. If they were to say, we want to expand that and bring it into the top 14 of the Champions Cup, you'd say? I'd say rugby is complicated enough. Uh, and that we've got to try, we've got to stop changing the rules all the time because I'm getting cross-eyed. Um, and, and that the only thing that I'm ready to listen to is when the player's attitude cannot be changed. And when we were talking before about the French club's success in the past couple of years and the fact that some of them are taking it more seriously, one club that hasn't always taken it seriously is Montpellier. They beat Quinns over two legs by a single point. But before that second leg, they got a lot of criticism in the English media, made 13 changes between the two legs. What did you make of that? Because it was still a strong side, wasn't it? It was a strong side. I think it was a bit... I think it was a bit disrespectful not to give the coaches a bit of credit for knowing their team better than anybody else and maybe knowing players better than, than the English press would know them, which is fair. Um, I do think I saw, I saw Olivier Azam put a really funny tr- tweet where he's like, you know, actually we take it really seriously. It's a bit disrespectful. Huh? That's what winning gets you, um, gives you, gives you the right to, to fight back and, and, and to throw those comments. I think they're a little bit irrelevant. I don't think they should care about what the press say. They don't dictate, you know, what is the truth or not. They only know what the truth is within their team. But it is, it's a reality that maybe not in that example, but a lot of teams in France have didn't uh, um, uh, play it 100%, which digs a hole and throws a dagger at this competition every time that you don't see the big names on the field at the same time because those are the clashes that you want to see. But look, they were proven right. You mentioned the Toulouse game. They won it by a single point over two legs as well against Ulster. Antoine Dupont, you can't keep him out of the headlines. But you also mentioned he wasn't playing very well for 50-odd minutes. And do you think Ulster might have held on if it hadn't been for that Tomato 
red card? Uh, I don't, uh, again, that red card. How the hell does Rob Ehring not get anything? He throws a shoulder in the face too. <laughs> he doesn't even get a, a yellow, nothing. <sighs> so that's that's where rugby gets it wrong. It's complicated, right? If you apply one rule, you apply all the time, whatever. Um, I didn't mean that Antoine Dupont didn't play particularly well. I mean, Toulouse as a whole didn't actually play that well. I saw a lot of drop balls. I saw some misunderstanding. I saw some some yeah silly decision making but they put six phases together they go forward all the time Meafu comes in he's unstoppable Anton Dupont goes at 10 dummies and scores the important part under the sticks you're like is there anything they can't do those kids they, they really are that good and you're playing without Julien Marchand who was who's still injured you're playing uh, you know without a couple of guys both uh, Arnold the uh, second row brothers uh, were out so they're playing with no more second rows uh, almost towards the end um you know they, they've they've got they've got a few guys that are missing in, in that back line and it's been very problematic and they still killed it so i'm very very impressed with them i think that's the sign of the true greats when you're like oh you lose six points at home mm, it's too loose you just don't know and they did not look like they were overly um uh, how you say that um move, not moved but disappointed or down by the defeat you know uh, and I was listening to the game. It was commentated in French. And there was a, the commentator that Julien Candelon, former sevens winger from Perpignan, was a really nice guy, was saying, well, we saw them at the hotel and we actually turned around. The, the sort of the team manager, Jérôme Casalbou, don't know if that rings a bell. He was number yeah. nine for France. He's won the Champions Cup in 96 against Cardiff for something. He's won top 14, I don't know, three or four times. Uh, Clément Poitronot is the skills coach. Um, you know, Virgil Lacombe is the scrummaging coach, Jean Bouillou is the line outs coach. They've all won either Champions Cup or a few Brennus. The president of the club, Lacroix, was a former back row who won the Champions Cup and probably won the Premiership. I mean, they are uh, how do you say that? They sweat out in their titles, ti- titles, and CVs. Oh, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty sure the groundsman is probably like a, like a <laughs> Brennus hold up winner, you know, so they are pretty incredible in terms of uh, knowledge of what it is to win, knowledge what it is to have that mentality of never giving up, of always uh, rising up to a challenge and all that stuff. I mean, look, I, I was banging on about John O'Gibbs, Ronald O'Gara, the, the, you know, the most experienced European uh, coaching duo. Oh, look at Toulouse. They've got like eight of them within their coaching staff and their administration in roles that you would never even think of. So, yeah, it's that. I think that really... Um, how you say that? shined or was underlined by the performance in, in Ravenhill, they just never seemed to panic. And they, they backed themselves to the moon and they delivered, even if, the, especially the first half, was actually a relatively average performance without an intercept try of, by Romain Tamak, who pretty much runs the field. It's a complicated one. And they're going up against another side who the European Cup is in their DNA as well. In Munster, in the quarterfinals, they did well to sell effects to fairly comfortably over two legs. Graham Roundtree, who you will know from your Leicester days, he just retired, hadn't he, and was an assistant coach when you were at Tigers. He's stepping up to be the Munster head coach next season. What do you make of them at the moment? And have you seen this where they're going to have to play their home quarterfinal I in saw, Dublin yeah. instead of Limerick because Ed Sheeran's playing the concert? What do you make of that? Yes, mate. Um, uh, <laughs> so Graham Roger wasn't he was an assistant coach at Leicester. He just left. I think I think he got picked up by England or uh, or he went for the under 20s and stuff but he was always around very super nice guy and I, I had the pleasure of bumping into him when I was playing for France and he was actually coaching the forwards of England and we were you know chatting about x y and z very approachable super nice outstandingly strong you know ear work uh, <laughs> like unreal that's all I could look at I mean he's got massive little things next to him but he he jokes about it he's, he's a legend of a bloke really good at his at his at his stuff um and in the, ends up you know uh, having a, a stellar coaching career between the Lions and Munster now head coach and I think he's going to do a great job I think I I'm I'm a huge believer that you need to have a charismatic um uh, coach who's got a lot of empathy a lot of love a lot of respect and he's definitely all the way up there for that um, Munster is one of those rugby myths, incredibly regionally, how do you say that, ingrained or um, uh, structured team that they know their stuff. They know how to do things. You talk about the Leicester way, the Clermont way, the Saracens way. There's definitely the Munster way. 
because they they're just a team like no other in the world, which is the huge compliment in my eye. And they've got a stadium like no other in the world. Huge compliment again. They've got fans that you can't you know um, mistake for any other fans in the world. Um, so that will be a proper game of rugby. That's exactly what I love about rugby. Munster to lose quarterfinal, not in Dumont Park, unfortunately, because of Mr. Sir Ed Sheeran. Then you've got to move out. But look, let's just let's just rugby how it is, huh? Uh, Racing build their new stadium. They're saying no. So that date, that date, that date. That's Rolling Stones, Madonna, Beyonce. You guys can burger off and play somewhere else. So it's the reality of rugby now. You got to pay. You got to pay the players. And Toulouse did beat them at Toma Park last season yeah so you know they, they wouldn't have been intimidated by going there anyway but if you are no. to lose you're probably thinking i'd rather it was at the aviva maybe maybe but maybe but uh, but munster are capable of putting forty thousand munster fans and the Aviva or fifty thousand munster fans at the Aviva that will scream five times more than i don't know how many there are at thorman park maybe 15 or twenty thousand or something so it's a different setup it's um it's a still a very important venue for Irish rugby, um, and so Munster can thrive on it. I just think it's going to be a fantastic game, and uh, even more people will be able to assist and to cheer them on. So, Tom, you even better. And were you surprised by how comfortable it was for La Rochelle over two legs against Bordeaux, given what we've seen from Bordeaux in the past few years? Yeah, three legs actually, you know, because there was that top 14 one before. True. So that made it extra special between Racing and Stad and La Rochelle and Bordeaux. It must have been weird, weird weeks. When you uh, when you play three times the same team for the same result, funny enough, Racing yeah. beating them three times and La Rochelle beating them three times, uh, so that that will be a tough one, a, a tough pill to swallow for Christophe Furios. Um, I was very surprised of how how um, I said how confidently they they beat them. Really impressed with La with La Rochelle. They're extremely powerful. Oof. They're a big old bunch of players. Um, I think in my mind they're even better than. Then, you know, last time they went around and, and lost to, to Toulouse in the final. I just feel that they've got that extra bit of experience. Victor Vito is probably not having the same type of season, but Greg Aldrit is even better. Um, they have Jonathan Danti now at 12, and poof, he's a handful as soon as he gets properly going. Uh, Winnie Antonio has got better. I don't know how, I don't know why, but I just feel he really has, you know, stepped up to a whole different dimension, probably helped with, by his positioning in the French team. Um, so really impressed by La Rochelle a little bit disappointed by Bordeaux I think something's unclicked there uh, probably they have too many injuries they keep on struggling with depth uh, they just can never field absolutely everyone and I just hope it's not one of those uh, seasons where they disappoint again because I remember there was one season that got canned in, in, yeah. in top 14 and they were first and they always said I was an outrage and this and that and this one they were doing really well and now they've dropped off so now it'll be it'll be a very tense um, moment of the season but I think deep down Christophe Oyos is, is clever enough to say they didn't have the depth in the squad to go both uh, both competitions so actually it's, it's it sort of so, suits them to be able to focus on, on top 14 because oh my they're going to have to roll their sleeves up in the next I think there's four or five rounds left and it's it's going to be properly intense Right we will look ahead to what's coming up in the next few weeks very shortly but it's about time we did our meter Moment of the week, isn't it? So what have you got for us, Benji? Oh, mate, that's, there's, there's plenty, but I'm going to be extremely boring. I'm going to have to say the little genius man, Antoine Dupont, scoring the 78th <laughs> minute at number 10, under the sticks to make the conversion easy-weezy, uh, makes, makes rugby look ridiculously easy uh, and effortless. Uh, as, as soon as you go there. So there's there's loads of moments. There's, there's the... Um, you know, the Racing Stad with Toulouse Avianu, who was incredibly good for Stad, especially in the first half. There's Clermont stepping up at that really young num number 18, number 18, number nine, who's 18 years old, uh, Julo, who I thought was incredible and represents all the future bright lights of Clermont. There's, you know, a ton of performances. There's the moments where Toulouse on their line start playing from their own zone and Thomas Ramos chucks it to Piato Movaca, who then, you know, doesn't want to concede a five-minute try, whatever, all that stuff. But, that final moment where you're like, right, what exactly do we need? There's three minutes left. We need to score points under the stakes, just to be sure. Okay, kick it to touch. Bang, 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 bang. It's almost like Antoine Dupont's like, you know, boys, just put me at 10 because it'll be easier for me to just walk in on my own. 
And he goes bang, 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 left, right, left, right. And he comes out and he scores almost effortlessly. So a meter moment of the week has to be Antoine Dupont pretty much giving the the win, a crucial win with scoring that try for Toulouse in Ravenhill against Ulster at 78th minute. We should get one to someone to do a running total over the past year or so in the next couple of years. How many times Antoine Dupont will win the meter <laughs> so moment boring. of the week? I think I'm going to skip his name now. The nine from Toulouse. You know, it's just, just him, but him, that guy. But, you know, I never mentioned his name again. There we go. That was Benji's meter moment of the week. And meter is the world's number one wireless meat thermometer, recently making over 11 million cooks better with their game-changing app and completely wireless Bluetooth meat probe. You can use it on a barbecue, in the oven, or in a pan, and you can get your hands on one at meter.com. Plus, we've up the stakes, Benji, recently, and you can now get 20% off any full price item instead of 10%. All you have to do is enter the code FRENCHPOD20 at checkout. That's FRENCHPOD20 instead of FRENCHPOD10, and you'll get 20% off any full price item at meter.com. Barbecue season, boys. Barbecue season. Get them coming. We haven't got long to wait until the quarterfinals of the Champions Cup either. Only a few weeks. Are we going to see three French teams in the semis again or not? No, it's so- in my, in my mind, so tell me if I'm wrong, but on the left, I see uh, Racing Sale, uh, La Rochelle, Montpellier. And the yeah. other side, I see Munster, Toulouse, uh, who's, and Leicester, Leinster, correct? All the titles, yeah, on that side. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> um, with Benny Youngs telling me after the game, Leinster, ooh, he's like, yeah, but mate, if you got to play them, you might as well play them at home in the yeah. quarter straight away and just see how good we are. And I think it was the perfect attitude. It was going to be one proper game. So Toulouse having to go into in 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 uh, in Munster that's a that's a big ask. But I think if they get a couple of guys back, if there's one team that can do it, it's them. Uh, La Rochelle Montpellier, obviously a French team in the semi, but I reckon it'll be La Rochelle. I think so intuitively at home. But Montpellier, whew, they're doing an incredibly uh, strong season, and they're really holding up high. You know their level and their rhythm and their tempo and their intensity. Um, and then Racing against Sale at home in Paris, I see Racing going through. So La Rochelle, La Rochelle Racing, they'll definitely be a, a French club in the in final. And if there's one team that can do it to go into the semi, it's it's Toulouse. But Toulouse will have a seriously tough draw. You know, Ulster, Munster, Leinster, maybe, or Leicester to then go to the final. Poof, that's a tough one. So... French team in the final, definitely. Two French team in the finals, I think is very probable. And let's have a very quick look at the top 14 as well, because we're very much getting down to the business end of the season. Now, you mentioned it, four games to go in the regular season. Your mates, Franck Azema and Julian Dupuis at Toulon, are putting a hell of a run together. It's going to be tough, arguably too tough, but can they do it? Can they make the playoffs despite being nearly, nearly bot on them not so long ago? Man, they, they, they are definitely charging back. But when you look at their side, did you look at their side? Yeah. I mean, they've only got Sergio Paris, Fagundo Issa, Charles Olivon now in the back row. All right. It's not, it's not too bad. They've got uh, Eden Elizabeth with either uh, Romain Tao or the big uh, Brian Alouloulounissé. Oh, nice. You know, they've got uh, Brooks, the former guy from Northampton, Christopher Toulouse at Hooker, Jean-Baptiste Gros at Lucid, who's with the French team, Baptiste Serrin, Carbonel, uh, Duncan Paeva, but Erito. They've got Chelsea Colby. They've got um, Gabin Villiers on the wing. Emmerich Luc and Gabin Villiers, who was one of the best players of the last six nations. Yeah. Hey, bloody hell. Of course, of course they should be chasing. And the weird thing is, because they're doing really well in Challenge Cup too, I think they beat yeah. Treviso. Yeah. And they're through. Because Challenge Cup does qualify you for top six, I reckon they will concentrate on Challenge Cup. And the finals in Marseille, Marseille is 50 minutes away from Toulon. Uh, so it will be a huge sort of a club uh, moment for it. I mentioned all those guys, but they don't have 600 of them. And they've got Sergio, who is, who is obviously getting wrong a little bit, even though he might resign for another year or so. He's just never ending. Uh, so I, I think they will fall short of the top six because I know those, those races. And everybody's like, oh, I'm super close, super close. We're only eight points, seven points, six points. Yeah, but that means the teams in, ahead of you, they need to lose twice. You need to win twice, but they need to lose twice. And nobody really <laughs> loses twice in, in that league at that pace. So you're always sort of catching up, catching up, but a bit too much. So I don't think they'll make it. I think they'll concentrate on Challenge Cup. I reckon they'll win the Challenge Cup if they don't fa- face Saracens too quick. 
at least get to the final in Marseille and that'll be a proper game. Toulon to lose in Toulon this weekend. Huge game. That'll tell us a lot about whether they will. Yeah, 100%. And But Toulouse will have to rotate, mate. I reckon they'll be flogged after the last two weekends. Um, so it'll be interesting. And the top two going head-to-head this weekend. As well, we mentioned Bordeaux a bit earlier. Montpellier flying. Bordeaux have lost eight of their last nine That's games unreal. in all competitions. Unreal. It's unreal. It's it's very hard to comprehend and to understand. And Montpellier are flying. I think Bordeaux will have will have a, another really tough night. Montpellier are no fun at the moment. It, they rotated, probably thinking about that game. That's where it tells you where their priorities are for sure. And uh, and it's going to be very complicated for Bordeaux. A bit hard to uh, to comprehend, uh, but but Montpellier deservingly all the way at the top. And come on then, Clermont. In eighth at the moment, are they going to sneak in or not? My heart says yes. My brain says no. It's complicated. Got some injuries. They again, it's 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 not like they're two points behind. They're like four or five points behind or something. It's that's it's it's a tough one, um, and they've got some proper big games coming up. So, I think the only way that I think I was speaking to the boys at the end, I think their last home game is against Montpellier or. Either they go to Montpellier or they host Montpellier in Clermont. I can't remember which one both. At home. So, they're at home to Montpellier. So if Montpellier are already qualified, there's a chance that they might give that one up and that could be the decider for Clermont. But I think it will be very, very tight. Well, we might as well call it then. Let's not sit on the fence. Four games to go. They're currently in there. Oh, oh man. Yeah. The top two are gone, aren't they? La Rochelle. Save, that, save that for Johnny next week. It's fine. Yeah. Just leave me the easy stuff. Trust me, we'll be putting him on the spot as well. Uh, La Rochelle cast to lose and Racing. And you mentioned points on the board is what you want. It's tight below them. <sighs> I, I still think it's going to be complicated because there's also Lyon behind. So I reckon I reckon the top six will not change. Um, and that and that Montpellier, Bordeaux, La Rochelle, Castres, who will hang on by a thread unless they get pumped. Well, it's basically this weekend. Because Clermont are going in cast this weekend. But I don't see that. Nah, my, I'll, I'll stick to it. Montpellier, Bordeaux, La Rochelle, Castres, Toulouse, Racing will qualify in my mind. Thanks, Benji. A big thanks to all you guys for listening as well. Make sure you hit subscribe. Leave us a nice review if you can. Check us out on Rugby Pass as well as on YouTube. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Au revoir, Benji. Cheers, mate. Pleasure. Bye.